Okay, good morning, everybody. We are starting a new unit today. This will be unit five, okay? We just finished up mitosis as part of unit four. So we're going to get into meiosis, which most of you, I believe, just knowing your educational history here at our school, most of you should have some uh, idea what's going on with this stuff, okay? So nothing totally new here today. All right, let's just go over some basic terminology to start off our, our talk here, okay? You've probably heard these terms, but we have to sometimes stop and give them formal definitions, okay? Um, remember, um, PDFs of these notes are all on Schoology. PDFs of the guided notes are on Schoology. I made both a Cami and PDF version of the slides. If you want to write on the slides, you can do that sort of thing too. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about what, what does genetics mean, okay? Genetics is something that's been around uh, for quite a while, okay? But it's not the same as heredity. Heredity is older. Uh, people have been looking at, uh, well, how do these traits go from uh, parent to offspring for, for, you know, probably since the beginning of, you know, agriculture and maybe even before that, okay? Um, so genetics is looking at uh, heredity and variation within heredity and studying its cause, patterns, and trying to track down which genes are responsible for what. So, underneath the genetics, we have heredity, which we just talked about. Traits from one generation to the next. So, that would be like, I'm going to inherit eye color. I have a widow's peak. I have a terrible genetic disease. Like, any any one of these things could be part of heredity. Um, people at home, do you need me to turn on present? Would that help? I'm going to go ahead and do that real quick. That way you get the whole... Maybe this will help you at home. All right. So let's move on a little bit while well, those people are getting dialed in. We call the things that you pass down traits, okay? And there's always, you know, some things are very obviously traits, but some things maybe not. So there's always sort of this, you know, question about personality and, you know, well, I really like, um, you know, to eat uh, jello. Is that something that I'm going to inherit from, you know, I don't know. Um, some people say the, the, the jury's still out on that. So some things are environmental. Some things are inherited. Okay. Um, so how do your offspring, I mean, we are all offspring ourselves. So how do we or our offspring get these traits? Well, we inherit or acquire these genes, and genes are just snips of genetic code, by inheriting portions of the information on our parents' chromosomes, okay? So we can do genetic testing on you, and we can prove that, uh, you know, who your parents are, and that's because little snips of that are going to match your parents' DNA, which is a popular theme for many daytime TV talk shows. Yes, you are not the father. You are the father. Mother's usually pretty easy since she has to be there. All right. So, this is a set of siblings right here. They all have some similarities. Obviously, their skin tone. Obviously, their hair color. But they're all completely unique as well. 
Okay, so these are all the same. These are all um, the offspring of you know a particular set of parents. Why don't they look exactly the same? Okay, it's because in asexual reproduction, I'm sorry, in sexual reproduction, we shuffle the deck a little bit. So many of you have siblings. Some of you I've taught your siblings. Some of you, you kind of look the same, but you're not identical twins, right? So you you're, you both started with the same deck of cards. So some of the cards you're dealt from your mom and dad might be the same, but not all of them are going to be the same. All right, so let's talk about asexual reproduction, okay? Asexual reproduction is where a single individual makes an exact copy of itself, and there are no fusion of gametes. What's another word for fusion of gametes? That'd be like sperm plus egg equals a new cell. Yeah, zygote is what we would call it. That's right over there. So we, we would see... Um, we would not we would not see any fusion of cells okay so if you if you kind of take take it like if you for us it's like birds and bees it's we're very used to it but just taking sexual reproduction from a biological point of view where two cells just kind of like mix together all on their own it is pretty miraculous that it that it happens like to to combine cells from you're taking cells from two different organisms and making a new organism. That's that's pretty cool stuff. So asexual reproduction, we don't see that. So it is a lot simpler. And those are going to be exact copies of the parent. So imagine you were an exact copy of your parent. Some of you are having a nightmare when I say that. All right. The only variation we get in asexual reproduction is mutation. So any change in an asexual population would happen much slower than a um, um, sexual population. Now, you've probably heard we're starting to see mutations in the COVID virus. There are now I don't know, three or four variants out there we're hearing about that are, um, we've got the UK variant. Um, somebody said there's an Ohio variant that was <laughs> discovered at uh, Ohio State. I'm not sure that one's officially recognized yet. There's a South African one that's really um, supposed to be much more uh, transmissible, much more lethal. And there's also, I want to say, a Brazilian one, I, I think. Russia? Oh, they, maybe they're not being very um, open about theirs. I don't know. I mean, I totally believe you. This typically, this typically always happens in a pandemic. Um, um, a lot of times the mutated versions are more... Um, um, transmissible, but maybe less lethal. If a virus is always 100% lethal, it doesn't do a very good job of spreading because it kills all the host. So a virus that has a really high lethality is not as, uh, uh, it doesn't spread as easily because all the hosts die. So we see these mutations in, uh, COVID, but some people argue that viruses don't really even reproduce asexually, so it's it's not really what I want to talk about today, but it's something in the news, all these mutations. Anytime something's copying itself on that level, okay, you got to think that when this infects you, it's going to make probably billions of copies. Um, all those copies are, are sources of, of possibility for mutation so um so far we think the vaccine will still work on the uh variants because the vaccine um recognizes the virus by its outer coating and that hasn't changed yet that that i've heard 
I'll be honest. It, I, when, when it first came out as a biology nerd, I was trying to read every article that came out, but I've kind of got a little bit of, I don't know, COVID news fatigue, and I don't follow it as closely as I should now. All right. So the type of reproduction of these cells, not viruses, is going to be mitosis. Okay, so they're going to be exact copies of each other. Lots and lots of plants do this. Um, lots of uh, bacteria, yeast, a lot of single cells things do this. Um, so we see this mainly happening in plants and, and really small single cell sort of things. All right. So let's talk about sort of a comparison here with sexual reproduction. That's where you're going to have two parents, male and female. Okay. Let me just pause for a minute and just kind of throw this out there. I know um, gender and biological sex are two different things. I'll just pause and recognize that. I will try to use the terms male and female, biological male and female. Okay. If that makes sense. Um, so I'm a little, you know, it's not the, the terminology I learned when I was learning all this. So if I mess that up, please be patient with me. But that's that's sort of what I'm going to attempt to do. Okay, so in sexual reproduction, all offspring are unique unless they're identical twins or something. So you're going to be a unique combination of genes from your parents. Now, what does that mean? That means your parents have a set of genes. You are going to pretty much randomly get either a, one of your mom's copies or one of your dad's copies. Now, listen, your parents have two genes. You get one of them and you get them randomly. So all this randomness leads to a lot of variation to the point that you are going to be genetically unique from everyone else, even people you are very, very closely related to. You'll have genetic variation. Now, that variation truly is small, okay? If I took all of my genes and all of any random human on the planet 99.9% of those genes are going to be the same, okay? The, the plans to build a brain cell are, are pretty much the same in my body as they are in your body. Same thing with a muscle cell. There will be slight, slight variations, and those are small enough to make us uh, the, the unique people that we are. So don't think that, like, your genes are like totally different than everybody else's. It's just a small portion of them that give you that variation. Okay. Cause the plans to make a bone cell in my body and your body are going to be 99% the same. All right. So what does that mean? We get genetic variation from siblings to parents. And this is a good thing. We do not want to make carbon copies of our family tree all the way back, you know, from the last mutation. We'll talk about reasons this is good, but you probably have already heard them before. Things like if there's environmental change, the variation in the population will allow some of the population to survive. If, the, uh, if a pandemic demic comes through, most of the time, anytime a big disease comes through, there are some people that just seem to be not as hit as hard. But that also means there are some people that are very, very susceptible because that variation. Okay. How's my pacing? Everybody good at home? All right, good. All right. Let's talk about some term, more terminology here. Okay. Homologous. Homologous means like the same, but not exact copies. Okay. Um, homologous might be like everybody in my family drives a Toyota. All of our keys look exactly the same and they even go in the keyhole. 
So the keys are very, very, very similar. But when you get down to the exact details, those keys won't turn on the other car, but they're, they're, they're super close. They, they fit in the same places. They have the same information on them, okay? So a homologous pair of keys might be like, here's some keys from Toyotas. A new homologous pair might be like, here's a set of keys from a Ford, okay? So these homologous pairs, they have the same functions. They just don't carry the exact same information. And they also will, will fit together just like a, a key, two keys might be able to trade, but it won't start the car. So they're the, they're the same, but they're different, okay? They're the same, but they're different. An example of that might be like you go buy uh, like socks by the pack. If you go buy like a pack of socks, it has like eight pairs in it. Those are sort of like very, very similar socks, but they might have slightly different patterns on them or something like that. So homologous pairs are the same information areas but it might have information on different information on it. Another example of that would be this. If I collected everyone's Ohio driver's license in this class, I know there's some difference between uh, over and under a certain age, but just pretend they're all the same. Everyone's picture is in the same spot. Everyone's name is in the same spot. Everyone's address, eye, hair, weight, color, or whatever, are all in the same spot but every single driver's license is unique, okay? So my driver's license and your driver's license are homologous, but they have different information on them. That's kind of how I want you to think of this. So you get a driver's license from dad that's going to have different information on it than the driver's license from mom, okay? So what we see in homologous pairs are like i said you can either think about it like the car keys with different bumps on them so the car, the key will work only in one car but they're still very similar or you can think about them as two different driver's license all the info is in the same place but the info is different okay so my driver's license is the same size and color as yours it carries the same information but it's unique to me. Do those little analogies help you kind of wrap your head around this? They have information in the same place, but the information is maybe not the same. Yeah, you got to be very careful with this carry same genetic information. That's more like categorically than the exact copy. Like all driver's license carry the same information. It's just different for every person. That's what a homologous pair is like. All right. Now, in... Mitosis, when these are copied, we make exact copies, okay? It'd be like making a copy of your driver's license, okay? Now, in sexual reproduction, one, one of these comes from mom and one of these comes from dad, okay? One of them. Okay, so that leads us to something called karyotypes, okay? Now, first of all, chromosomes are not this colorful, okay? This is something that we've done to this slide to make it visually easier for you to understand, okay? I will say this, though. Chromosomes got their name. Chromo means color because when they were first discovered, they were dyed with different stains, and they said, oh, look at these colorful chroma colorful things so that's where they got their name but that, it, that that's the only thing that means in a karyotype we usually 
arrange them from size. Not all chromosomes are the same size. So you put the biggest one down, and you can do this for other things, but we're mainly going to look at human ones. And you have your first pair of chromosomes, okay? Your second, third, fourth, all the way down to your last 22nd set. And then you have these special ones over here. What are these ones? Your, your either XX or XY. Those are your, somebody said sex chromosomes. That's right. So they put the, the all the, I'm going to call them regular right now, but they do have a special name. They're autosomes. They put all those first, and then the last one they put is your, your uh, sex uh, chromosomes. Um, now, again, back to like biological gender, this isn't always black and white, okay? We have in our minds that, that sort of biological sex and gender, you know, the baby comes out, it has a penis or a vagina, and that's what it is, and that's what it is. There are lots of sort of legitimate biological reasons that you could be born with either, you know, biological male or female genitals, but you're actually not fully one way or the other. So there are some middle grounds here that we'll talk about later. It's, it's, it's a really interesting topic because in our minds, we think there is male and there's female and that's it in biology, but it's not that simple. Um, human beings have one set of sex chromosomes. There are some animals that have multiple sets of sex chromosomes. Platypus have 10. Like every, there's always these exceptions in biology and platypus tend to always fit them. Birds have some, some different ways of doing this. Um, we're not going to go too far down that road, but I just want to let you know that biology has found more than one way to figure out what we, what male or female means. Okay. So just, just know that like biological sex is not black and white. It is for 99% of more, you know, humans, but there are occasionally people born that, you know, for whatever reasons, these, these don't really determine your sex. They turn on hormones that determine your sex. If something goes wrong with that, you may be genetically XY, be born with a vagina, okay? Your gonads are actually testicles that are internal. And when you hit puberty, you don't start menstruating. You don't develop breasts. And so there, there's just a few ways this can happen. We will, we will mention some of them. I don't want to get, I don't want to make the whole class about that, but it is something a lot of people seem to be interested in. Okay. So karyotypes. A karyotype is a display. It's almost like a high school yearbook page where you line up all the pictures. ordered by size and length, okay? Now, this is not a real one. This is a cartoon. And it can be very difficult to see what's really going on in a real one. See, they don't always, like, line up like they're in a marching band or something. They, they can be hard to put to pose almost for the picture. It can be hard to get them lined up. All right, everybody at home still with me? Thank you, Zach. All right. I see some people still writing pencil notes in class, so I'm kind of using them as my cue on when to move on. I don't want to get going too fast. Okay. Everybody good? Can we make it? All 
All right, here we go. So let's talk about the words diploid and haploid, okay? Before we even put any words on the slide, you can see the diploid have how many copies of each chromosome? Two. Haploid, think of that as haploid. Um, they have half the number, which in this case is one, okay? So we call um, body cells have two complete sets of each chromosome. Now, right here, it's like, yellow yellow but in reality one of those is from mom and one of those is from dad the green the long green one one of those is from mom and one of those is from dad okay the uh i don't know flesh colored one there that one right there one is from mom and one is from dad so when you look at those you've probably all done punnett squares before back when you've done some earlier work in genetics, okay? And in a Punnett square, we usually take a trait and we give it one, uh, two letters, okay? Big B, little b. When you think about a Punnett square, think about, I want you have, I, I don't think we do a good job of this in basic biology, but where does the big B, little b come from? You have two copies of each gene, and one of them comes from each parent. So you got a big B, little b on that gene, maybe a uh, big R, little r, and maybe a, uh, I don't know, big T, big T, okay? What kind of cells are these in humans? Sex cells, sperm and egg. So if Mr. and Mrs. Right or even Mr. and Mrs. Wrong get together, each parent can only give one of their copies, okay? That's why when you make a Punnett square, you're figuring out the probabilities, okay? Uh, so maybe we get a big B a big R, but it has to be a big T. Okay? So there's a 50-50 chance it's either one of those. If they're exactly the same, there's there's a 100% chance. Okay? So when you do Punnett squares, don't just say like, well, Sater gave me some letters. Here we go. Think about, well, they're, they're coming from the diploid cells. Okay, so if dad makes a sperm cell, he's got a 50-50 chance to give either one of these or the other. If mom makes an egg cell, she's got a 50-50 chance to give one of these or the other. I don't know if that helps draw a connection, but I think it's something we, we biology teachers miss a lot. Okay, so I kind of already led up to this. Haploid cells have one set of each chromosome. The male gives one, the female gives one, and the offspring go back to diploid, and they have a copy from your mom, a copy from your dad. So in humans, that number is 23. All right, we okay over there? I'm gonna go ahead and go unless somebody says wait. I will wait one second.
All right, how you doing now? Can I go? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and go forward. Um, here we go. Now, all eukaryotes have DNA that's packaged up into chromosomes. Okay, we talked a little bit about this in the last unit, how DNA wind up around histones, nucleosomes, chroma, chromatid, or chromatin, and then it'll become a chromosome. Okay, so all eukaryotes package DNA in chromosomes. And so there are two types of chromosomes, and I've kind of been hinting around at this when we looked at those karyotypes. We put them into two categories. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. 22 of them are autosomes. It does not matter if you're male or female. Those are going to be the same. The only difference between male and female are these ones down here, okay? Now, I want to stress something to you. This doesn't mean that every trait related to sexual sexuality and biological sexual function, that doesn't mean every single gene that makes you biological male or female is on the X and Y chromosomes. All that does, those control the hormones that release the plans for you to express those biological sexual characteristics, okay? More muscle mass in men, as an example. A female example would be like wider hips and breast development. So just because you have sex chromosomes, not every protein related to sexual expression is going to be located on them. Everybody okay so far? All right. Human fetuses kind of start out as very generic, blank female, and then it's not like they're fully female, but if you're male things kind of like turn inside out. If you're female, things kind of fold inside. Okay, all the parts are very, very similar. Okay, you just got to like look at them with an anatomist eye. All right. So anything that reproduces with sex has a haploid and diploid number, okay? So what does that mean? That means that all the body cells are going to be diploid and all the sex cells are going to be haploid, okay? And plants do reproduce sexually, okay? That's what flowers are. Flowers are plants' sexual parts. Um, if you are allergic to pollen, you're allergic to tree sperm, Okay? Kind of gross, but it does. They just, they reproduce without touching. They just send everything into the air. A lot of animals that live in water can reproduce without touching. They just release things into the water and it finds its way where it needs to go. Coral do that. Okay. All right. So some things fertilize externally. All right. So this is stuff you're probably fully aware of at your age, but most organisms have a life cycle that goes sort of like this. And not uh, almost all mammals, birds, and reptiles follow this, but plants, this can get a little bit weird on where this happens in, 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 in their body shape and, and time. Okay. Fertilization and meiosis alternate in sexual life cycles. So um, you basically have um, mitosis all the way up until you're sexually mature and you start making sperm and eggs. And then for a very short time, 
life is haploid over here. So you have an unfertilized egg and a sperm. Those get together and you go back. Okay, it's a cycle because it goes back and forth. But we spend almost all of our lives in mitosis and just a very short time in meiosis. So fertilization is when we go back to diploid from haploid. So we have haploid cells, which are sperm and egg. One sperm plus one egg equals a zygote. After a zygote divides, my embryology is not the strongest. Embryology is very, very hard. These things start having different names. I think it's called a blastula or something. Because the zygote will divide. And very quickly, this is kind of really cool if you like this kind of stuff. Um, very quickly, um, different tissues will start lining up. It'll, it'll divide into an outer, middle, and inner layer. And all those become certain types of tissues. It's called ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Um, ecto becomes your skin and nerves. Endo becomes like your digestive tract and all your, epi all your, uh, see, I can't remember. One of them becomes all your muscles. It's, re it's really interesting, but I'm a little rusty on it. So zygotes differentiate very, very quickly. As soon as they start dividing, you start getting specialized functions. Okay. So. Meiosis shouldn't be that hard because if you paid attention last unit and you understand mitosis, meiosis is basically almost mitosis two times. Okay, it's, it's very close to that. So you still have an interphase and you still have a pro, meta, ana, and telophase, but it does it two times. So you have meiosis one where you're going to have a pro, um, meta, anaphase, and telophase, and then you're going to have meiosis two, where it does it again. Now, what do you notice about the, the scarlet and gray on these chromosomes from start to finish? What's it doing? Yeah, it's mixing up, okay? So this really fancy thing called crossover happens, where a these, these chromosomes, in biology textbooks, it just kind of shows them standing side by side like a middle school Valentine's Day dance. But in reality, they are like two teenage octopus making out with each other. They are tangling up all over the place. And little snips of them will break off and trade places, okay? They do this at really well-defined points, okay? If I was going to cut my driver's license in half, and then match it up with a different driver's license, I would have to cut it in the same spot, okay? So the same sort of thing, the, the well-defined points this happens in, this allows you to shuffle the genetic deck for more variation. More variation in a population is good. If this didn't happen, then siblings would only be, you know, Probably, I'd have to do the math, but there, there would be like a, a much smaller combination of what siblings could look like. Now, it would be high because there's still 23 chromosomes that could randomly go either way from mom and from dad. But this makes even more variation. Okay. How am I doing on time? I'm almost to the end of the first session. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop it here, and we will pick this up here tomorrow. I'll uh, stay online, and I'll tell you what kind of work I would like you to do. I'll let you kind of do that independently. There's only a, there's a limit to how much your brain can take on one of these lectures a day.